Welcome to the Omnibus Show, a program for people who are interested in everything, with deep conversations on a wide variety of subjects. And now your host, Dave Gibbs. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Omnibus Show, the program for people who are interested in everything. This episode's guest is Anna Afshar. She is a um, artist in her own right, and she's got quite a story. She is a painter and a writer, and it is great to have you here today. Great to be here. Welcome, Dave. Anna. Thank you. Great to be here. Well, thanks. Um, you have such a, a fascinating history. Could you give us some of your milestones about your story and what led you to become an artist? It's a very long story. <laughs> I will try to compress it. Well, my biggest milestones, I guess, would be I came to U.S. in 1992, mm -hmm. and I had a degree in chemistry, in analytical chemistry. I think I always loved art. I was raised to appreciate art, but since I did not exhibit any extraordinary abilities at the young age, I, was, I never had an art class, I think, mm -hmm. in my whole upbringing. So, but I... I went to museums, I grew up in Russia and Lithuania, I went to Hermitage very, at a very young age, and I grew up appreciating art. So only in my 20s, actually, when I already had my own child, uh, who left his paints on the, on, the, on the table, I decided maybe I should try painting. And I, I think, of course, I drew when I was a child, but like I said, nobody thought there was anything good. So and then I... That led to taking a class and then another class and um, learning with the best teachers, the best artists uh, I could encounter and um, showing my work to people and people seem liking it and people starting, starting buying it. And then um, I worked in corporate America for 20 years, and mm -hmm. I, art was a hobby for a long time. But then I always say the best thing happened to me. I lost my job due to job cuts, and it was the best thing that happened to me because I, could never, I would never take art professionally and full-time if I had a job. And as my, one of my friends at, my jo at, at Roche, where I worked, told me when I was frantically looking for another job, he said, if you will never give it 100% to art, you will never know what you can be. And I remember his words every day because what I have is just putting 100% and more effort into what you love and doing what you love. And now you have your own yeah. studio and you're, yes. you paint internationally. Yes. So, yeah. So that was kind of another milestone. Life through my children brought me to Germany. And I started teaching art here too. I do have a degree in teaching chemistry, so mm -hmm. life brought me different way teaching art. And yes, I uh, be, because of these connections, I was able, I'm able to actually go back to Europe and teach there. And of course, Europe is so small; it's easy to travel around and uh, paint everywhere. I love painting in plain air and telling my story and story of everything I encounter and which sets my soul on fire uh, for my paintings. And that's, uh, I'm really grateful, but at this point of my life, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. well, that's, 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 I know your pictures, so I really love your, your paintings. And um, I particularly like the one, unfortunately it was, it's been sold, is your nighttime picture of Indianapolis. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you have a lot of great pictures, but because I, I live in this area, it's just that is like a, a location um, picture. And I, I really like your um, racing car pictures Thank with the you. Indy 500 that uh, is you. up at Cafe Buandi. <laughs> and, um, but um, is there a, a particular, um, oh, what is the word? With the, the acrylic or watercolor or oil, do you have a particular medium? Did you pr prefer um, yeah. one of those the most? Yes. So I started painting in watercolor mostly because mm -hmm. it was 
easy to transport and, st and still when I paint on location and when I travel, I bring my watercolors with me mostly. Mm -hmm. Uh, and also I had little children at home. I was told it's um, less toxic to have uh, watercolors around children, oh, but actually gotcha. that is not true. Watercolors, cadmium is toxic in any medium. So. I see. But anyway, it was just something I thought at that time and uh, I, lo I, I love still, I still love watercolor. It's very unpredictable medium. Uh, very exciting because you never really know what you will get if you if you let it paint itself. Mm -hmm. So, but lately I and I have been painting in oils and acrylics as well for a long time as well. But now I'm taking oils kind of really in, in, I think on a different level and I paint oils with palette knife because palette knife in oils gives me the same freedom I have in watercolor with the brush. Sure. And I think. Being trained as a watercolorist for so long, when you know you really don't have a chance to correct something, uh, and I believe watercolor has to be very fresh and spontaneous, and you mm -hmm. put it down and you leave it and see what happens. So palette knife gives me this opportunity with the oils. But lately I've been doing acrylics with the oils too. I never was kind of, this is again, new chapter. Um, I'm learning how much acrylic paint I have to use to get the same effect I, I can have with oil because acrylics don't move and not as, um, not as pasty and not as um, buttery, I guess. So yes. they don't, you, uh, they're, they're, they're much more plastic. Flatter, right, right. Would you so say they're flatter, flatter, so you have to a use matte, it a little bit of. in a different way. So, yes. yes but, so yeah, so I paint in all three mediums, but I also lately I've been working in mixed media actually because I do love photography as well. Okay. But I don't consider myself a photographer, and I don't want to take that <laughs> part, that uh, part of art and media because it would be totally too much. But I love monoprinting, and I I'm I said I think in, I mean obviously I have. 50,000 I think images right now on my on my media Wow! Uh, which I just uh, from all my travels and everything and I just don't have probably enough I don't have enough lifetime to paint everything I encountered in addition to painting in plain air which I do every you know every week every day through life here too and everywhere so doing monoprints of my photograph and incorporating them into mixed media piece with collaging and painting really brought a different um, yeah, I br brought a different spin on what I do, but it's very interesting to see reaction of the public and my customers to that part of my art. They come and they love it, but they, they are very confused. Is that you? So people come to my studio now and they say, how many artists are here? And I said, it's just me. I so, like that. <laughs> I think it's great that you have that diversity of subject matter and how you do that. I think that that makes you very interesting. Right, but in art world, uh, you have to do know, one what's, thing what's and your be thing? known for no. For, yeah. I still try to maintain it's watercolor and watercolor on canvas. This yes. is something not too many people do. Yes. So it's mostly it's a, paper. Right, it's mostly it paper. Takes a which, paper. Right, but mm -hmm. now days with different substrates and different mm -hmm. grounds, you can create anything with watercolor and then varnish it, and it just creates different effects. And so, yeah, there is opportunities in art are endless. So, that, and in that's any a wonderful medium, thing. That is, is a wonderful it's thing. A wonderful so, who would be some of the? I know on your website you've mentioned some artists, but. Who are a few uh, artists that really stand out that have been influences to you? Well, uh, among living artists, I would say Alvaro Castaniet. I He's a quite famous watercolorist around the world, known around the world now. I took his class uh, about 12 years ago, and he judged a show in Indianapolis, and he rejected my painting, which was a very beautiful, perfectly executed photographic image of something I saw. And he looked at it and he said, this is illustration, this is not painting. And then he looked at another painting I had of my dog, which was painted very freely with a few brush strokes. And he said, this is a good painting. And it just clicked. 
for me uh, that encounter and uh, his teaching and in addition to his workshop which was totally above my head at that time but I've learned so much from him so him among uh, artists who are diseased probably a sergeant uh, mm -hmm. his watercolors very amazing and very contemporary um, at the at the time and at the turn of the century 20th century but many of course great from Velasquez and Da Vinci and uh, Michelangelo you know their drawings and to today artists so many Andrew Wyeth mm -hmm. uh, my mother Anna, liked Wyeth yeah Wyeth art. is incredible yeah. so I mean, I'm discovering somebody every day, but I just recently finished a book and I've seen his exhibition, Francis Bacon is um, one, or Lucian Freud, uh, some British mm -hmm. uh, artists who, uh, for example, like Fran expressionist. Fran right. right, well, Francis Bacon, he was a figurative artist, but his paintings are very distorted. And when you see them, they're really, you, you have to probably Google them. Not many Americans no, know I've, him because I've you seen, know him. Yeah, I've he, seen his art. he painted like meat and bodies, distorted bodies and everything. But there's so power in them, so much power, especially when you see them live and the scale of them. So, so he'd be so popular yeah. in art school, right? Probably, yes. And I'm sure he is. And in addition to him being a very funny Irish guy who lived life at large and was um, a really interesting character and he, 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 this combination of his pretty dark art and his light yeah, pers personality and yet very also philosophical personality mm -hmm. so this is something has been my fascination in the past few weeks but I don't know what is next a book I find or podcast <laughs> and I will listen to something new and learn something new so well it's fascinating the thing that I like about you particularly because it's you, the person, is most important. But your art is that you, you're dynamic, you know, I, as opposed to what it's supposed to be. I like the, um, <clears throat> I like the fact that you have a, a dynamic personality and character in doing your art, that you're willing to do different things. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very fascinating. Now, you travel... And I've seen pictures in Paris and Germany and so forth um, and around the United States. Um, do you have a particular travel pattern that you like to take when you do your annual trips? Or do you, let me restate that, do you have a favorite place? Um, and if it's not the central Indiana, I won't be offended. But do you have a, a favorite place that you like to do plein air? Honestly, probably not really. I I love Indiana cornfields and farms just as much as li I love Paris and its bridges or London. You know, it's just really where life takes me. And I do like to l uh, learn about something I paint and I work on in, in depth. So I like to, dis to, that's why I go back to Paris or certain places in Italy again and again because I want to get to know the culture and get mm -hmm. to know architecture and just in general get to know the place I have fallen in love with but it changes like for example everybody was very surprised my friends when they knew I I have never been to London before last year but then life took me to London twice I went to through London we were going to see my son's performance went to Portugal also because of my son and a commission they have wonderful son right so it was pictures right right yes so it Portugal. was amazing and then I decided to go to an art fair in London and it was in a couple of weeks after my trip because I kind of I knew now where I was going and I knew where the art fair will take place so yeah I kind of I'm very much go with the flow person in a way and yet I don't want to over crowd my um my impressions and sometimes I say I have the sensory overload too mm -hmm. many you know when you see sure. too many things so some things I like for example I so many people go to Greece and people ask me, do I want to go to Greece? I said, yeah, I mean, I don't know, because I don't think I have enough time to discover Greece as much as I want to discover a place. You know, I'm learning French a little bit. I'm trying to learn Italian, too, so I don't think I have time for Greek language. <laughs> so 
I, so this is kind I of grew up with a lot of Greeks up upstate, right. and they, they have wonderful food. I love mm -hmm. them. Um, but I want to go to South America, you know. I want to go to Africa. I want to go to Jordan. Like Somebody just posted pictures from Jordan, uh, and I always knew I, I love um, I've read books. With the iron-rich soil, a lot right, of red right, soil right, right. there. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that's I love the like, history of King Hussein and Queen, his his wife, it's American Noor. wife, Queen Noor. Noor. So, uh, I think I, I read her book 20 years ago, and I always thought I want to visit Jordan. It's a different part of Middle East, kind of unique country in Middle East. I think. Mm -hmm. So, my my. My little bit of, of that is I, in my hometown, I actually grew up with a family who were from Jordan. Your name, yeah. And I learned a little bit about the country from them. And um, it's fascinating. I, nice thing about where I grew up in Northwest Indiana is just I, a lot of immigrant people. So that kind of gave me a more international outlook. Of course, with father in television right. and mom in um, insurance, she met all kinds of people and so that was fascinating so to end this chapter i'm very curious and i think it's a fun question to ask a painter is what's your favorite color wow black <laughs> black's a good color. i wear mostly black i i just hang a dress like on friday too. after our show i thought i think i need a new black dress <laughs> i specified so but this is a joke I, you know Again, it's just what the mood is. I mean, I love color. I love red. Obviously, I love blue as well. But I think black makes a statement. Yeah. Even in the painting, in a colorful painting, black makes a statement. Mm -hmm. Black line can finish. It's, it's definition. Make or it's a definition. It can yeah. make a, or break a painting. So I do have, I think, a lot of black um, in my paintings, too. Like, I love painting cars, race cars, and that shadow under the I car and the tires. I love your and it, your, right, your pictures. Right, so it just it always gives me this <laughs> when you do it with the brush or a palette knife. So. Yeah. Well, my favorite's blue. So you see me with a lot of yeah, blue shirts. Yeah, I do shirts, see you with the but, blue yeah. shirt a lot. Blue's a favorite right. color of mine. It always has been. I don't know what it is. It's I tend to, like, I'm drawn to warmer things, but blue has a sort of a warming effect I don't know how to explain. Yeah. Even though it's a cool color, yeah. it's, well, a, because everything it's a calming looks, looks kind of warmer next to it. Yeah. If you put the, con the um, con contrast, together, contrast to it. Yes, yes. But it's always interesting to find out when somebody, about their art and about, um, you know, that aspect that's going on in your imagination on... <clears throat> On, on your artwork, because it's getting into your mind on how you create right, right. And, um, and what are some of the interesting things. And thank you, Anna. And that's it for Chapter 1 in our interview with Anna Afshar. We'll be back in a few moments on The Omnibus Show. Welcome back for Chapter 2 with Anna Afshar. And we would like to thank Hotel Carmichael for sponsoring our show here at Feinstein's. So now in Chapter 2, I'd like to ask you about um, art itself. And um, for those who are starting off um, young artists, or even people who are young artists who've been on in life, um, but are starting out. Just some, some questions, some ideas of how, what you would recommend for studios and, and how to do art and what is some good suggestions. But going back to, to artists, um, for someone studying art, who, who, do you have a particular artist that is very good for someone to study? Um, you know what I mean, at the beginning. Is there, is there a particular artist? Because I know usually you do figures, you do uh, drawing. When I studied um, photography at Indiana University, I actually took a fine arts course in drawing. Mm -hmm. And what that did is it helped me become a better observer and, a, um, and also helped me with perspective. Mm -hmm. That's why I took the course. And it was one of the best things I did. Mm -hmm. 
Um, do you have any such recommendations? Well, I said, such recommendations are very personal, you know, for, for I think every person who um, would s start in art. But what I tell all my students and when, when, when they come to my um, classes, I say there's only one good teacher, one, one teacher which you really should study from. And they look at me and, and I said, it's you. I think you just have to start creating art mm -hmm. and see what is inside of you or what is outside and what you want to say. Then study with the people you admire, whoever you admire, you know. So I said, for me, there were many, I started studying um, at Indianapolis Art Center actually with Joan Cardwell, who was mm -hmm. a very good watercolorist and a great teacher, a little bit a timid teacher. She never told me when something was really bad and she should I see. <laughs> <laughs> I think good teachers should tell tell you tell you the tell, truth. Tell you the truth. Yes, she was afraid to tell the truth. I see. So that was the only bad thing about Joanne, but she was, and she had a nice group of people who came to study with her, and most of them were kind of just social artists, you know. But I think if you really are serious about art, and if you want to create serious about expressing yourself and serious about doing something, it's it's a very solitary endeavor to create mm -hmm. art it's like not writing. a social right like writing so even though it's fun to of course to study from your peers and i love painting with my friends and i always learn something from them mm -hmm. still most of the time you spend time by yourself in your studio and you need that time to see what what comes out of you mm -hmm. right so it's personal uh, who but studying with people who inspire you, of course, it's very important. And just going to the museums, looking at the art you love, see how they did that. Mm -hmm. And with the living artists, if you can get a workshop with the best, uh, that's in your field. Like if you're an oil painter, of course, you would start with oil painting and vice versa. But I think studying different medium is very important. And for me now doing like we, we talk different mediums, they complement each other. And I, I'm not a purist now in anything else. I paint watercolors sometimes like oils, basically putting dark shapes next to light shapes in the beginning of the painting, not just layering little by little sure. how traditional watercolors are. Interesting. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah, studying with the best, studying different mediums, studying um, art, and also developing your taste. I think... Uh, one of the, I was thinking about it today a little bit, um, one of the things which really takes you in a different level in art, in the art that people would want to buy and people would uh, connect with is taste. Um, I love this amazing quote from Ira Glass, um, uh, you know who it is on American Life, and he uh, he has this, and I always quote it to all of my students, There there is a video about that, but to become better in anything, in writing, in painting, you just have to do a lot of work. Yeah. And after you do, when you do a certain amount of work, which separates you from people who move fo forward with it, is a good taste. You know, you know, your cre what you're creating is not quite good yet, but a good taste will dictate to you where, where what, is, what is your aim and where you sure. want to go. And. <clears throat> you should never quit in, on that intermediate stage. When, when your taste and your ambition, when your ambitions are not aligning with your current work yet. You just, mm -hmm. you, you just have to create a lot of work to get better. And so your gap between your ambitions and your taste and what you're creating today will close. But I think also for us artists, it never closes. You always want to do something different, something better. Mm -hmm. And what is better, it's all very arbitrary, right? Well, it's kind of like your life path. And I think right. a lot of that, and as I said, this program is for life learners. And right. uh, it's that aspect of the, the creativity level in the creatives is very high. And mm -hmm. so it's, again, like your dynamic mm -hmm. uh, personality and character in what you do. Um, that just, you're always learning. And so right. it's kind of like getting into a story, like all of a sudden your life is in a, in a story 
and mm-hmm. you're going into another hallway or you're going into another country or something like that and it's kind of expanding your you know what you do right which is very and also maybe i should mention eventually when when you do this your your style and your line of work your focus will develop i think you know naturally for me i, I i'm not also promoting or um yeah i guess promoting would be a good word but you have to do a lot of different things you know and be here and there you do eventually have to focus on something yes that's true. But you I have think to become this yourself. Will come, right? You have to become yourself, right? You don't, and that's why a lot of mm-hmm. people study. With, I, I met some workshop artists, you know, who only paint in workshop, and they try how this person paints and how that pa- person paints or sculpts, or sculpts or something. You have to become yourself. But I think by doing work on your own and your a lot of your own work in solitude will will help you to achieve that eventually. Mm-hmm. That's good advice. When I was at Indiana University and I, I switched from being a, uh, pursuing being a reporter to a photographer. Mm-hmm. Of course, I was a writer across the board, so I did both. But uh, as a photographer, I actually I learned more when I went to fine arts. Mm-hmm. Um, the teachers there uh, allowed us to, to do more in an artistic sense. And I think that that really expanded my imagination on how to do it better. Right. And you, you wanted to take photographs that um, were almost like art pictures. I mean, that well, photojournalism is different than like fine arts approach, but at the same time, you can still do it in an art with an art sensibility. And I thought that is where you want to go. Um, mm-hmm. I liked older stuff when I was growing up. It was like the older black and white pictures. Um, if you look at pictures from say. I don't know, the 30s, the fi- but particularly like in the 40s and 50s, there is a, a strong, um, heavy amount of silver in print, mm-hmm. in black and white mm-hmm. prints. And so you'll see a much denser print. And then really, um, before I went to school in, um, and in the 60s that carried on, and then they got into color, and things moved in the color direction. And um, from the 70s into the 80s, there was... Um, um, they took out a lot of silver. So you see, if you look at that period, there were a lot of thinner pictures, and mm-hmm. you know, they're flatter. And uh, so I liked looking at the older books, like photographers from, say, the 40s and 50s, and... Um, um, Compare it and... Exactly. Yeah. And one photographer that um, I thought was really helpful, who influenced me a lot, I never met him, was Eugene Auger. Mm-hmm. And um, he took mm-hmm. pictures of Paris. But I liked a lot of the French photographers because they were, and a lot of the f- early film people, because they were very big on vignettes. So this is my own experience on the, in photography. And um, they would, um, they kind of made that interesting, you know, that, um, you know, it's very popular. And it's still popular, but I think it was popular in the previous past when people would have a feeling of location and place. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think if you, you look at Ajay, he had a huge influence, whether people know it or not, on um, photographers and cinematographers. I will look him up more. Yeah, Eugene Ajay. Um, and what was important about his work is that a lot of his work he actually did for, he take pictures of places around um, Paris and it would, um, from my memory, is that he did a lot of that work for, um, for artists for the stage. And he ended up, what it ended up being was he ended up being a documentarian photographer because he took pictures of Paris before mm. World War I. Okay. And then he went on after that and got pictures before World War II of Paris and a lot of Paris that's not there anymore. Mm. But, you, you know, you can find that in, in any town, any place. Um, there's a tendency to copy things. But as you said, best teacher is yourself. And, mm-hmm. and you learn from what your taste is, what your experience is. And that's, um, that's very good advice. Mm-hmm. And thank so you. thank you. Um, so for people going into painting and so forth, something in a, a practical um manner or matter of um, studios and Mm -hmm. um, 
just brief thoughts on studios and, and gallery, because galleries are very important. Oh, not in today's world, okay. I think, anymore. Or but the, I mean, well, it's, it's changing. It's always nice changing, and I think, I mean, I, I have one gallery representation, and I'm not really seeking any gallery presentations because I, I mean, I love having my own studio in a beautiful building, and I like, uh, of course, this camaraderie of other artists mm -hmm. among, uh, with, um, in our building, in the art community, I reside, my studio resides. I do art fairs as well. So, of course, for anybody who wants to market their work, it's important to get out there. Uh, actually, one of the our local artists, Constance Capilitis, I heard her podcast a few years ago, and she said one of the best things you can do to, as an artist is to show up. So I always show up. I showed up today, right? You did. <laughs> so, it's important to... Um, and we're all fortunate for really it. Right. And I mean, I enjoy it. I enjoy human connection. I think everything in life is relationships. And I love naturally fostering this relationship. So mm -hmm. I think selling art and living off your art, relationships are very important. And my relationships with my customers are very important. And they're very genuine. And, and for me, it's always, I'm so tickled when people connect with something an or, like, Unordinary, not just a flower I paint, but something like in my last show in uh, on Friday, somebody bought a uh, this painting of a church of two people talking, an old man and a woman, and mm -hmm. it, was called, it was called the Advice Il, Il, Il Consiglio in Italian, uh, which I encountered in the old church Santa Bibiana in Rome, and oh, okay. somebody came and loved that painting, and they said that there was just something in their connection and. So, so things like this, uh, these connections which we create with art and through art are very important. And I think that's what um, sells work for, mm -hmm. <clears throat> for artists uh, historically. So, but yes, but having, I think, having time to paint, allocating, making time to paint, making time to create art, I, I shouldn't say paint all the time. Of course, I'm a painter, That's but okay. I, I don't disregard I sculptors, writers, anything. Sure. I mean, everybody has to have time to create, and um, our lives are busy, so a lot of people who don't succeed, I think, in their creative process are those who are kind of dilettantes, who don't... Uh, who Dabblers. Are dabblers, yes, and I have a student in Germany. She's always very funny. She says, oh, no, I'm just a dilettante. I just paint <laughs> like in your class and sometimes. So, yeah, so if you want to. She came for the uh, croissants and coffee. Uh, right. Well, she's actually quite good, but she's funny. But she knows who she is. She said, you know, she goes, she uh, has other priorities. But right. if your priority is art, you should make it a, a priority, priority, you know. So you go yeah. and show up at the studio every day and sure. you work every day. People ask me a lot, do you work with. Uh, how do you have inspiration? I said, I have inspiration when I come to my studio. I start, even if I, I mean, I never have problem of not knowing what I want to do. Actually, my, I have an opposite problem. I don't know what to do because I have so many ideas all the time and I don't know how to focus on it. So then I hear a word of my yoga teacher, focusing on one thing at a time will make you keep your balance, just one point at a time. So I try to do that. So yeah, so having, Time and space for your work is very important. And having studio, a lot of people are afraid to spend money, you know, on studio sure. outside their home. And I, for me, it was a big step um, up when I rented studio at Stutz. And even when I had studio in Carmel, too, but at Stutz was my first working studio. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it skyrocketed my my. Uh, creativity and my, uh, of course, connections and everything. So I think it's very important to have the space. I think our brains are pre-wired, but you, when you step into your space, workspace, you nothing else exists. At home I have laundry, dogs, kids, you know, but when I go to studs, even when I'm working on my emails, I, I sit there, I don't talk to my friends, I answer my work emails, you know, my, sure. my business emails. So I know it's kind of, and I think like sometimes I'm even at home, I'm thinking, oh, I need to order cards and this and that. But I think I'll go to the studio and do it. It's my place to work. And 
that space keeps me focused. That's it's good advice. Important. Yes. Now, it's going back to the personal, but this is this is for advice to the young painter. Is um, do you have, if you're willing to tell us, do you have a place that you like to go that gives you um, artistic inspiration? Well, my studio. If I'm working in the studio, but really everything. I love. Let's get back to Indianapolis, like you mentioned. My pieces. Yes, I honestly I cannot keep my paintings of Indianapolis in stock. People love them and I love painting them. Well, you do them but so also, well. Thank you so much. But I also, I have favorite locations. Like I do, and I, I actually also heard it from another artist on one podcast. She went to same location 365 days a year, like for every day. And she painted this same scene 365 times and they were all different mm -hmm. because it's a different atmosphere, different... Um, time of the year and so forth so I never get tired of painting and painting mm -hmm. the same scene especially when I do in plain air because there's always something new so actually a few weeks ago I went back to I have this spot on South Meridian with the monument and yeah. people love it it's Indianapolis and I thought okay how can I do it differently today and then this blue Mustang came and parked in front of me and I thought that would be cool. A monument with the blue Mustang. And so I'm actually nice working on this piece. It's, in a, it's a nice color, your favorite blue. I put some, I, I thought about, you know, I do like yellow. So some yellows around. Yellow I'll put a lady in a yellow dress Van next Gogh, to her. Or Van right, Gogh, right. if you will. Yeah. So something like that. And I blue think and that will make, some, make it different. And I will call it blue Mustang. So, so yeah. So there, I'm inspired all the time. I say I always have to dial down my inspiration because mm -hmm. I don't have enough time and now I, I love to bike I bike in the in Noblesville in the countryside and then I grab my paints and I go paint farms and fields and I, I love that too so I love cities I love a lot of things which inspire me that's great and I have people I do a lot of figurative work I work from yeah. life in actually at Stutz I'll do a little promotion to Stutz and my inspiration mm -hmm. at Stutz talking about inspiration Jim Gerard. I think nobody knows him and he's not Jim Gerard on TV people sometimes ask me he studied in Paris for six years but he I think he's just the most amazing draftsman and Amazing encyclopedia of art and everything. Actually, he loves movies too. And again, not not uh, crit uh, critical enough, but that's okay. But he always uh, just I learn from him so much. He teaching classes without teaching really. We just draw figures. So and you did introduce us at your think, show yes, downtown. Yes, he was there. Yeah, yes, he was there. Jim Gerard. So yeah. come to Thank Stats you. for figure drawing with Jim. It's amazing that is um, I was gonna say something else about along the line of inspiration The funny thing about me is um, and some photographers kind of inspiration is bookstores but particularly in the magazines yeah, I don't know yeah. why is like interior I don't know I I can't explain to you why but interior magazines kind of flip a switch for me on my yeah, creative right, side right. And it just gets me thinking all kinds of ideas. But right. that's the photographer. Right. Well, the same thing. Actually, you're right. I forgot to mention that. I have a lot. I mean, art books. I'm addicted to art books and everything. The time I travel, sometimes on the first day of my time, you know, two weeks stay in Europe, I buy a book. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, how am I going to? Now I have to drag it around with me and then bring it back. And I have, so yeah, books, magazines as well. Especially those Rizzoli-sized books. Right, right, right. right. <laughs> Carrying that on airplane. Right. But I like even Vogue magazine because it's beautiful figurative work. And now with my collage things, I'm very, uh, mixed media pieces, I'm very, it brings a lot of inspiration as well. So, Fabulous. Yeah. Um, what's up for Anna? What is um, coming up? And what are you working on now that you would like to share? Uh, well, three shows coming up, actually four shows. We're having a big open house at Stutz this weekend. Again, another open house, which is organized by the building itself. And then I have three art fairs uh, in beginning of June. And so I'm focusing on that and uh, painting some... You know, art is also art business is a balance between 
what people want and what you know what will sell as well but something I love to paint but yet people will buy so Indianapolis for example so having shows around Indianapolis I'm preparing uh, a body of work of Indianapolis and Cincinnati actually too I like oh, to go nice. paint in Cincinnati so I'm doing summer fair in Cincinnati then I will travel again to um, to Europe and actually I applied for the art fair in London again haven't heard yet about uh, about the results but maybe I will get in maybe not it's always very competitive uh, field in general of art fairs so and then I have another set of shows in September and October and of course I like I said my new mixed media pieces um, uh, something new I'm working on and exploring oils further painting bigger so I'm always because I do so many small pieces as I work because I work on on location although again in my some trips last year my friend who is my also my very good advisor and my assistant sometimes she said why don't you roll your canvases and put gesso on it watercolor gesso and paint in watercolor and I did that in uh, in Portugal I actually painted much bigger on location um, on the table with a beer and <laughs> then I framed it and it was like I actually sold it on uh, Friday a piece from Portugal painted oh, nice. like that so yeah so painting bigger different challenging yourself always and but I think I will still stay with these themes which I love to paint. I mean, I created a few abstract pieces in mm -hmm. my art career, and people also seem like they connected with it, but I don't think I'm, I'm an abstract painter. I love to tell a story with my paintings. And, and they I'm really do tell painting. a story. Right. And it's a story that goes on the, in the imagination of right. the viewer. Right. The thing I've noticed with your art is you do bring... And it's not a class thing. It's it's a style. It's a European sensibility is like story, kind of like the French you, yeah. photographers mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, they're vignettes. They're big on vignette. If you go into French film, vignette is really the mm -hmm. key behind all of their storytelling. Um, Indiana has a long history of farmers, and our tradition and pictures have tended to be still life. Mm -hmm. I have two pictures in my dining area from my late Jeanette, my late Aunt Jeanette, um, mm -hmm. a portrait of my mother, and then somebody loaned her a Stradivarius, and it was a still life, but mm -hmm. the still life. And um, the European sensibility that you bring to central Indiana, and then there's T.C. Steele, that right, whole right, right, school, right, right, right. you know, a lot of still life, but y your pictures have that, there's movement in it. Mm -hmm. And I'm not place. a still life painter. So I do like flowers, fl florals, but I don't paint right. like fruits or dead, de dead, dead things. fish. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> I get it. But you know what I'm saying? That Euro sensibility mm. is, is really movement mm. in um, people in their place. And I see that in your pictures that differentiates from our more traditional oh, pictures thank you so, so much. Thank you. it's really good and i look forward to seeing look forward to seeing more of your pictures and we will um put anna's website up in the description thank you so much thank you so much dave it was great great was conversation great to have you here. and always uh, always great to even internalize what i know and what i can say say to young artists, for example. So it's always That's good to do that. Thank you, Anna. It was great having you on the show today. And thank you for being with us on this episode of The Omnibus Show with Anna Afshar. We look forward to being with you in the next program. If you enjoyed this program, please like, share, and subscribe to continue the conversation. For The Omnibus Show newsletter, please sign up at theomnibusshow.com.